welcome everybody to um, this meeting, Information Day, and also the annual general meeting of the Paget Association. Um, my name is Graham Russell. I'm probably the oldest one here, apart from Ron Taft over there. It's lovely to see you, Ron. Um, and I've been involved with Paget's disease um, most of my professional life. Um, I recognize some of you, but not all of you. And in starting, I'd like to give a special welcome to Sir Henry Paget and his wife here, um, who's going to be here all day. And uh, not to learn about Paget's disease, but um, to take part in various events. And I think we'll see more of him in the future, won't we? Yes. He signed the consent form for turning up at all meetings. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, give uh, this talk uh, to you today. It's, a great, um, uh, it's great to be here with you and, and uh, share this experience. So um, my task today is to tell you what, or explain to you what is Paget's disease. What I'd like to do first is set the scene. Uh, so I'd like to tell you about normal bone, normal bone turnover. Then we'll move on to Paget's disease and I'll touch upon whether Paget's disease is unique, unique to humans. Um, and we'll mention some unknowns about Paget's disease. So first of all, bone is a very important organ, a very important tissue in our body. It um, supports our body, it aids movement, um, it protects vital organs, um, it stores the bone marrow, which obviously is the source for, for, uh, of our, all our blood cells, and it is a big store of mineral, uh, which it releases as and when, when calcium is required for other cells, for example. Um, so in order to do so, bone has to be very dynamic and adaptable, and uh, it responds not only to internal stimuli, but also to external stimuli, such as gravity. So on planet Earth, uh, we have gravity, and by weight-bearing exercises, we can increase our bone mass, so we gain bone. Uh, on the other hand, if we go into space, uh, there is not much gravity there, and there is not much mechanical loading, and we lose bone. So how does this happen? Um, this is uh, 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 possible through the action of two cells, two main types of cells in, in the bone. It's the osteoclast, which resolves bone, so you can see the cell here in red. It resolves bone, it dissolves bone. And it's the osteoblast which has the completely opposite action. So it makes bone and, and it, it builds bone in a very orderly fashion normally. And these two actions are in balance. So we talk about bone resorption, that bone resorption equals bone formation. So this is all very balanced and that means that the, our bone turnover is healthy. So I don't know if you can see very well the outline of this bone here, but bone, like any other material, undergoes damage, undergoes wear and tear, and it has to be repaired. And the cells that do that, first of all, are the osteoclasts who come along, uh, they arrive on the scene, and they dissolve bone through the action of very um, very powerful compounds, chemicals such as hydrochloric acid and other chemicals. And then um, in their place, osteoblasts come along and in an orderly fashion lay bone. We call it lamellar bone. It's very fine and uh, it gets then mineralized and becomes strong and the uh, repair has been completed. And this is important for the uh, repair of the whole uh, uh, bone in our, in our whole skeleton. So um, we see, again, I don't know if you can see it very well, the, those pink areas are bone turnover foci in our skeleton. So as we speak, our skeleton undergoes renewal and remodeling all the time. And it has been estimated that it takes about 10 years to renew our skeleton completely. So now um, we'll move on to Paget's disease. So Paget's disease um, has been named by, uh, 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 after 
Sir James uh, Paget, who was an eminent Victorian physician, as we all know, and who encountered a case of a 46 years old man from the north of England who ca came to him with aches and pains in the bones. And through his acute um, acumen and uh, meticulous record keeping, he was able to describe this condition in great detail to us. Um, and he observed that this patient developed um, um, uh, significant bone deformities over time, enlargement of bones, especially of the long bones, but not only the long bones, also his skull enlarged such that he had to uh, change the size of his head. And this patient had signs of um, obviously bone expansion, tenderness, increased warmth, the classic signs of joint of um, inflammation, tissue inflammation. So, so James Paget thought this was a inflammatory process of the bones and he called it um, a, a osteitis deformans. So in fact, jo uh, bone inflammation leading to bone deformity or deforming bone inflammation. And this is the first um, patient, um, uh, this photograph from 1875. And interestingly, this description has withstood uh, the test of time. Um, however, um, nowadays we know that actually Paget's disease is due to focally increased and disorganized bone turnover uh, or bone remodeling. So if we go back to our skeleton um, with its remodeling foci, um, for reasons we don't completely understand in Paget's disease, this remodeling process gets out of control and it occurs primarily with aging, in the aging skeleton, so after the age of 55 or 50. Um, and if you focus on this shin, you will notice that this bone remodeling gets out of control, it progresses, and it can cause uh, bone swelling, deformity, classic uh, signs or features of Paget's disease. So um, why is this? How does this happen? So if we go back to our osteoclast, now we understand through a lot of research that has been done into Paget's disease, we understand that actually it's the abnormal osteoclast that drives this condition. So in Paget's disease, the osteoclast, the bone resorbing cells are abnormally large. They contain many more nuclei than normal, normal osteoclasts. And they come in big numbers to those resorption areas and they avidly resorb bone. So they dig a lot of bone away. Um, and interestingly, the osteoblasts, which normally come along in an orderly fashion, they try to fill those gaps in the bone in a very disorganized way. So haphazardly, very rapidly, and the bone, the effect is, is that the bone is weaker uh, and it has um, an abnormal structure and it expands. So this is an x-ray of a patient with Paget's disease in the right tibia, which you see the affected bone on the left side of your screen. And there are classic signs of Paget's disease there, radiological si signs. So there's bone expansion, there is cortical thickening, so that's the cortex, is the outer shell of the bone, it thickens, and the trabeculae become expanded and mottled as well. Um, and obviously it causes deformity and probably a lot of pain. So in a nutshell, Paget's disease is characterized by focally increased bone turnover, which is due to abnormal osteoclasts. Um, and interestingly, Paget's disease favors long bones and, and, and um, sort of weight-bearing bones and the spine and the pelvis, which suggests um, that perhaps mechanical loading to which obviously the bone responds, as I have shown you initially, uh, may play a role in triggering this condition. It is more common after the age of 55 and um, certain areas are um, more affected. Uh, the prevalence in certain areas in the UK is higher, such as the Northwest, especially Lancashire region. Um, so I've already shown you bone deformity in Paget's disease. This deformity can lead to osteoarthritis when the expanded bone affects the joint um, 
such as seen here, you can just about make out the ankle joint in the bottom of this middle x-ray. Uh, the tibia, the shin bone is very much expanded. It encroaches on the ankle joint and it causes um, uh, wear and tear there. And the bone is weaker, the pagetic bone is weaker, so we see um, a high incidence of fractures through, uh, through pagetic bone. Um, uh, Pagets uh, also um, increases the risk of, um, of hearing loss, of deafness, and there is evidence uh, that possibly uh, Beethoven, the famous German um, romantic composer, uh, suffered from Paget's disease which affected his skull. So here is an X-ray, and that causes his premature deafness. Um, here is an X-ray of a pagetic skull, which typical features, we call them cotton wool um, features, with a very much expanded and sclerotic bone, and you can compare it to a normal X-ray at the bottom. So you can see that um, the difference is striking. So uh, there are a number of complications that can develop with Paget's disease. This is a list based on, on um, an epidemiological study by Van Staar 15 years ago. And you can see from this that uh, patients with Paget's disease um, have a higher incidence of back pain, of osteoarthritis, or of hip fractures, hip arthroplasty, uh, hearing problems and uh, an increased risk of bone malig malignancy, uh, which is a devastating condition. Um, fortunately, it is extremely rare, so the, risk, the rate is um, less than 0.1%. <coughs> so how do we make the diagnosis of Paget's disease? Well, actually, up to 70% of patients with Paget's um, uh, are asymptomatic, so they have no complaints and they don't know that they have this condition. And a pointer to this diagnosis may be an elevation of one of the blood tests, something called alkaline phosphatase, which is a marker for osteoblast activity. Uh, usually an X-ray is necessary to make the diagnosis and an isotope bone scan to assess the extent of this condition. So usually all those three modalities are used to make the diagnosis assess the extent and assess the activity of this condition. So now, now at the end of the talk, I'd like to um, just to mention um, uh, that um, Paget's disease is actually not unique to human. Um, obviously, we are only one of the species amongst vertebrates, and a lot of other species have uh, uh, the same remodeling cycle in the skeletons, and so it doesn't come as a surprise. So, um, for example, dogs can get Paget's disease. There is one report in the literature of a dog that I came across which uh, presented with neurological signs which were put down to the skull uh, expansion, the expansion of the vault of the skull, uh, where very strong muscles attach, which allow the, bone to chew, uh, the dog to chew, um, and they are called temporal muscles. So again, possibly mechanical loading, maybe, uh, it's just a suggestion, uh, maybe a triggering factor there. It's been described in monkeys, so in the upper uh, limbs um, of the monkeys, again, a lot of mechanical strain there, and even in pythons. So this, um, uh, aged python presented with uh, vertebral deformities. You can see at the top of the picture how his, the his vertebrae stick out and on the x-ray you see that they are quite expanded and, and um, um, mineralized, heavily mineralized in keeping with Paget's disease. Intriguingly, even there is a paper on uh, Paget's disease in dinosaurs unbelievably. So um, this is based on the analysis of a micro CT scan of fossilized vertebrum from this dinosaur where um, you can see where the red arrows point to bone expansion, the cortical expansion in the vertebrae and motile trabeculae. So this is in keeping with, uh, with Paget's disease as we understand it. And those dinosaurs lived 150 million years ago. So it puts it in some perspective. So in summary, Paget's disease 
is a focal um, disorder of boundary modeling. It is driven by um, abnormal osteoclasts. It can cause a number of complications. It is not unique to humans and um, obviously there are a number of unanswered questions. So we don't understand why it is focal because the remodeling takes place all the time across the whole skeleton. Why is it focal? Why is it age-related? If there is a genetic predisposition, why we don't get Paget's disease in childhood? Um, obviously, the genes don't change. And what exactly causes Paget's disease? So uh, I just wanted to acknowledge a number of funding bodies that supported my um, research and career over the years. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Great. Well, thanks uh, again to uh, the organisers for inviting me to talk to you today. So in the next 15 minutes, what I'm going to talk about is the um, uh, incidence and distribution and causes of Paget's disease. Um, by incidence, uh, I mean how frequent or how common the disease is. Uh, the distribution, I'm going to talk about how it varies uh, within people uh, across different regions and populations, and also the really intriguing observation of the change in uh, disease frequency in the last 50 years, and then touched uh, briefly um, uh, on the potential causes of the disease. So how many people have Paget's disease? Um, there is a challenge really in defining how frequent this disease occurs because uh, a lot of people don't have symptoms. So if we just survey people and ask them have they got a diagnosis, we're going to underestimate the frequency of the disease. Uh, so in order to look at occurrence of the disease, we really need to look at bone itself. Um, and we can see bone either under the microscope and, and there are surveys which have been done looking at um, pathologic specimens of bone, but that's not really relevant for uh, clinical uh, practice um, and, uh, and clinical research. So the best way to look at bone is by doing x-rays of bone. Now large surveys are expensive and expose people to potentially uh, large amounts of hazardous uh, radiation. So this sort of accepted uh, approach to defining the occurrence of this disease is by looking at x-rays which have already been undertaken and which have been stored in, in hospital uh, x-ray departments. And this uses, uh, 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 takes opportunity of the fact that if you look at people with Paget's disease, about 90 to 95% of people will have the disease either in the spine, the lower part of the back, uh, the pelvis or the upper part of the uh, femurs, that's the thigh bones. And so if we have x-rays of those areas of the bone, we've got a good uh, 90 to 95% um, chance that that person, or, or we'll capture 90 to 95% of people who've got the disease. And so using that approach, that uh, looking at hospital x-rays and looking at the occurrence uh, of the disease, the best current estimate of uh, the frequency of Paget's disease uh, in this country is that it affects... Um, uh, sorry, it affects uh, two in a hundred people. One in 50 uh, people over the age of 55 have the disease. So looking at a sort of um, a more um, um, uh, health burden uh, statistic here, how many people in the country have the disease? And we can look at that by looking at the census data about the number of people uh, at, at certain ages and mapping the uh, frequency from these uh, surveys. And we can estimate that there are about just under half a million people uh, with Paget's disease in the UK. So this is a, a, a not uncommon disease. Now we've heard from Anna that not everybody uh, comes to uh, clinical attention. So the question is, uh, you know, what is the uh, proportion of people or how many people surface uh, to clinical identification? And the way we can do that is by looking at GP records and finding out the number of people who have been clinically diagnosed. Uh, and a survey uh, which was undertaken uh, 10 years ago um, looked at that and found that currently uh, about 40,000 people uh, have uh, or, or are on GP records uh, as having evidence of uh, the disease. So that's just under 10% of the people we know from the radiologic surveys who have the disease. So there's a big uh, discordance between the occurrence and the clinical presentation of this disease. Whether that's because these people are asymptomatic or whether be they've got symptoms and are being misdiagnosed or not diagnosed uh, is, is uncertain and for which we need further research. So we've looked at the burden. Um, <clears throat> let's look at the distribution in, in different people and uh, in different places. So this is data from a, a large survey um, and it shows 
uh, on the uh, uh, y-axis here, the frequency or the prevalence, as it's sometimes called, against age, which is on the uh, y-axis or the x-axis uh, on the bottom line there. And it shows that from the age of 55, the disease increases in frequency with age in both men and women, <coughs> though at all ages it's greater in men than in women. What about geography? Um, Anna sort of touched on this. Uh, this is data from a surveys or a series of surveys in the 1970s uh, where David Barker uh, and uh, David Geyer looked at uh, over 30 hospital in and across the UK, uh, including England, Wales and Scotland, and looked at the frequency of the disease in those different places. And a number of intriguing observations. Firstly, that there was variation in the occurrence of the disease. So it varied from 2% way up in the north of Scotland um, uh, to 8% uh, in uh, Lancaster, uh, uh, Wigan uh, area. And then secondly, there was this really intriguing finding of a peak excess in Wigan, Lancaster and Preston area. So these are, are Lancashire towns and, and hence this uh, Lancashire focus um, um, uh, which you may have heard about um, in terms of disease. So um, it's perhaps uh, not surprising, Paget, as uh, again Anna's uh, hinted, uh, first description of a patient was from the north of England, um, which uh, as we've seen is the, the, most, uh, the highest frequency. Uh, Paget suggested that this was because this person lived in a rather cold and damp place. We can't argue with that, but whenever we look uh, more wide across the uh, uh, continent of Europe and elsewhere it doesn't really map up to a, a sort of a, 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 a sort of cold uh, damp uh, hypothesis here it does decrease in frequency as you go from uh, 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 the UK to the southern Mediterranean so the frequency in sort of Greece uh, and Italy is less than half percent this was compared to uh, five percent in the um, in the uh, in the 1970 study but as you go up into Sweden and even across you know, 100 miles to, the, uh, to Dublin, the de disease de declines in frequency also. I think it's just a, 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 you know, a related to climate, so that data doesn't support that. So decreasing frequency as you move away from the, from the UK. Uh, looking at the rest of the world, the disease is uncommon in Africa and Asia. Uh, there are areas of higher frequency in America, South Africa and Australia, although they don't quite uh, reach the levels which uh, have been seen in the UK. So intriguing observations, um, difficult to explain by just genetic factors, and I think that's a theme which will come through this uh, uh, meeting, um, suggesting other factors in, in terms of etiology. One of the really fascinating uh, findings or observations, though, for me is the, uh, the fact that the disease has been declining in frequency uh, over the last 50 uh, or, or so, probably longer years. The best evidence for that, I think, derives from this country, um, where Again, a series of surveys looking at hospital um, um, x-rays, stored x-rays, uh, looked at the frequency of disease in 1974. And again, the same centers, the same radiologists, the same methods, again, uh, in 1994. So this was uh, comparable as far as it was possible to make sud studies which were done 20 years apart comparable. So what the key finding was that the prevalence or the frequency of the disease had declined from 1974 from 5% to the 2% which we talked about earlier. So it decreased, um, it's reduced to about 40% of what it was, um, let's say, in the 1970s. That peak excess in the Lancashire area, those were the towns where the decline was the greatest. However, they still remain the highest frequency of pagets, certainly in that study. So Lancashire, there is still a Lancashire focus, although it's much, it's much more attenuated than it was uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the earlier study. Uh, this data has been replicated, uh, you know, the, the fact that this is declining in frequency has been replicated uh, in other uh, parts of the uh, world, particularly in um, uh, Australia and uh, New Zealand. Um, um, uh, and again, the reasons for that are, uh, are intriguing. Um, more recent data from the UK suggests that if you track forward to 2000, uh, we see a continuing decrease in the disease. So um, we've talked about genetic causes, we've talked about environmental causes. Um, most of the research or recent research in Paget's focuses on the genetic causes and the, the human genome is you know, a large uh, code for um, making proteins um, um, and it's collapsed into what we call chromosome little packages um, 
And the evidence that genetics is important in clinical research uh, derives from the fact that uh, when you ask people, is there a family history of the <coughs> disease, about one in eight um, say that there is a family history of disease, which is strongly suggestive that there is a, a genetic component. And when we look at the uh, genome roadmap here, um, there is a strong link with changes in the genetic code in chromosome 5, and particularly one of the proteins which are made uh, in one of the sites of that uh, uh, chromosome uh, called P62. Now, mutations in genes or mutations in that area um, are found in up to 50% of people who've got familial Paget's disease. That's people who've got a family member uh, and about 5 to 10% of people uh, who don't have a family member. Um, the mechanism is, um, I'll leave to others to explain in more detail, but it seems in some way that those mutations change the proteins which disrupt normal signaling of the, um, the cells which are responsible for Paget's disease, particularly the osteoclast. That's the osteoclast resorbing bone, which is greatly activated in Paget's disease and resorbs bone at a higher rate, which leads to the disease occurrence. There are other genes which have been identified, and I think we'll, we'll talk about those there as, as well later. So is this just a genetic disease, or are there environmental factors? I think the, the epidemiology data is a strong clue that there are other factors, environmental triggers. But in terms of you know, more formally looking at that, um, one of the best ways to, to do these types of um, uh, studies is to look at um, people who live in a, an area of disease which is high frequency and then they move to an area which is lower frequency. So if when they move they retain that same high frequency of disease then we can say it's probably genetic whereas if they move to this area of low frequency and their uh, occurrence of disease drops to this sort of uh, rate of the population to which they move then we think that it might be an environmental trigger. And there's some data from a study in uh, 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 looking at people who moved from the UK to Australia. So UK is a high frequency area, Australia a lower frequency area. And what they found was that um, if people who moved from the United Kingdom to Australia, the prevalence of disease or the frequency of disease was lower than it would have been if they'd stayed in the UK, but higher than it was um, uh, from, uh, if they'd been born in Australia. Which is kind of suggestive that there's probably both mechanisms, that there is a genetic, or a genetic risk and probably that there's an environmental risk uh, as well, I think as alluded by um, uh, Anna. So what are the environmental factors? They say most of the research is focused on the genetics. A lot of research, you know, 10, 20 years ago was uh, around whether or not this was a, uh, uh, there was a viral uh, trigger for this disease. And one of the first clues was the finding within the osteoclast of particular uh, microcrystalline in, uh, called so-called inclusion bodies which are found uh, in people who've got paramyxovirus uh, infections. So it's a kind of very strong drive to look for whether or not this disease was in, infectious or not. David Anderson at the uh, Salford, uh, just up the road, uh, thought this might be a zoonosis, a virus infection which had crossed from uh, um, animals um, to humans and particularly canine distemper virus. And so he looked at people in Salford attending his clinic and compared to people uh, who weren't uh, and found that those who had or did own a dog were more likely to have uh, uh, Paget's disease. Um, when you look at other studies, the data isn't consistent with dog ownership. There are other studies which suggest that other pets are linked with uh, Paget's um, and other studies which suggest that pet ownership isn't linked with Paget's disease uh, either. Um, there are a number, though less um, uh, frequent studies looking at other potential causes, other risk factors, things which uh, are more common in people with Paget's than who don't have Paget's disease. And the list I've outlined on this table, contact with farm animals, cattle, consumption of offal, smoking, one or two studies, residency near mines, lower milk consumption, uh, wood-fired heating, measles as a child. There's not really any strong, consistent risk factors which are emerging from these studies um, uh, to give us confidence that they are causally linked. So in terms of the cause, uh, I think the best we can say now is that the, it's a disease where there's a strong genetic component uh, which confers susceptibility, but that, that there's an underlying trigger which is currently unknown, but which might be viral in nature. So why Lancashire? I guess that's the kind of big question. It, we don't know. I think what happened in Lancashire uh, in the late 1800s was a, a great influx of people, urbanization, and um, you know, communal living. So if that there was a virus which was triggering this, one can imagine it might have spread 
in that high concentration of people and also the poverty which occurred at that time and which is therefore decreasing as uh, the situation is changing in the, you know, in the, in the recent times. So just to summarize, so Paget's disease is common. Um, many people are asymptomatic. The frequency of the disease has declined. Uh, there is very uh, wide variation in occurrence worldwide and, and within uh, the uh, UK. There's a genetic predisposition, uh, though the, uh, and there seems to be a trigger, but that remains uh, uncertain at this time. And we need, I think, further research to better understand the cause of this disease and, again, why this uh, disease appears to be declining. So thanks very much. Yeah, my hospital is based just outside of Cardiff, and what it's most famous for is having the longest hospital corridor in Western Europe, uh, over 500 metres long, and, and we're very proud of that. So, I am going to talk about treating Paget's disease, but I'm going to start with a case presentation. So this is a man who's been attending my clinic for a long time. He first came back in 1992, when he was a mere youngster, age 66. And he had Paget's disease of the right tibia. So, and that's quite a common bone to be affected by Paget's disease. It actually first came to light some time before when he presented with a fracture. He was just walking along the pavement and his bone broke and he presented to the surgeons and they diagnosed Paget's disease. We've heard about Paget's disease predisposing to osteoarthritis, so wear and tear, if you like, in the joint, and that's exactly what happened in this man. He had premature, quite bad osteoarthritis in his right knee. We've also heard, heard about the pattern of pain in Paget's disease. This man had pain in his right tibia, his right shin bone, at rest, and the overlying skin was warm to the touch. That's a very typical clinical sign of Paget's disease. He had temporarily responded to various treatments, which were many and varied. And that's an important point when we reflect on the advance in treatments that we now use. So here's the list of treatments that he received. There may be some people here who are familiar with this sort of approach and having to have multiple treatments. But as we shall see, that has largely uh, changed. He first of all had a treatment called etidronate, which is a tablet, which is the first uh, bisphosphonate drug that we use for Paget's disease. And then he gets a series of treatments, shown in the orange, which are all different intravenous treatments. So he had pomidronate, clodronate, more pomidronate, and you can see he's getting a lot of treatments. Then uh, he got a course of tablets. In fact, he got two courses of tablets, two months at a time, and that's resedronate. Then he got another tablet, that's called teludronate, and I'll talk about these in more detail as we go through the talk. And then lastly, he gets the magic potion, which is intravenous uh, zolodronic acid, and, and we'll talk about that uh, in more detail. So this is an isotope bone scan. So this will show the bones that are affected by Paget's disease. And where it's black, you can probably all see it in the shin bone, where it's black, that's where the Paget's disease is active. And it's very hot uh, and uh, very active. He has a single dose of zolodronic acid, and the bone scan pretty much goes to normal. More importantly for him, at last, his pain was much better. It pretty much disappeared. The overlying skin had been hot and warm to the touch for all those years. He'd had all those different treatments. He gets one shot of that zolodronic acid. His pain is much improved, and it's now cool to the touch, or a normal skin temperature overlying that shin bone. And all was going swimmingly well till about four years later, and he started to notice a new pain. It wasn't like his previous Paget's pain. This was more a pain, very specifically, when he put weight on his leg, 
and he could kind of put his finger on it. He could point to it and show you where that pain was. And we did an x-ray. So here is a little crack in the bone. Can you all see that? So this is his shin bone. It's very abnormal looking. It's typical of Paget's disease. And he's got a little crack in his bone. It's a partial crack. And that's what's causing his pain. And it's uh, very typically when you put weight on it. We did another isotope bone scan to see if his Paget's disease had reactivated, um, but it hadn't. So it's very, very specifically just a crack in his bone. And you see this sometimes because the bone is still abnormal in texture. It's more likely to crack. It struggles to heal. And it's bowed. It's bent. And it's kind of pulling and keeping that fracture open. So it's quite a difficult thing uh, to deal with and heal. Um, and you can see that it is trying to heal, and there's a little bit of new bone forming. We can focus in a bit further on that. And you can see the bone is trying to seal off this fracture, but it's not quite managing it. And he was treated with a plaster cast, a full plaster cast, and then he was put in a kind of plastic boot or cast uh, brace as, as we call it, to try and immobilise that fracture site uh, to an extent. In fact, he's done quite well with that conservative approach. He could have gone for surgery, but they would have had to have straightened out his leg. It's quite major surgery, uh, and we decided to go for a conservative approach. And that has now pretty much healed. There's still a small crack there, but the fracture has largely healed, and he no longer gets any pain related to that little crack in his bone. He is still getting pain because of that arthritis in his knee. He's now 90 years of age and he's decided he's going to put up with that arthritis rather than go for any uh, further surgery. So that's, that's just to, to start off by giving you a, a case presentation, how things were and um, how we've moved to the preferred treatment, which is intravenous zoledronic acid. So it is a group of drugs called the bisphosphonates, which are the treatments of choice. And as you've already seen, we can either give them intravenously or we can give them as tablets. Relieving pain is still the most important reason to give bisphosphonates. And we might think that we get other benefits as well, but that's the most important reason for giving the pain. And if the pain really is due to the Pagets, then usually, you're going to get some benefit uh, from the treatment. So they relieve pain due to Paget's disease. This is bisphosphonates in general. The newer ones, and in particular intravenous zoledronic acid, are very good at making your blood tests go back to normal if they are indeed high at the beginning. They can also, to an extent, a limited extent, improve the X-ray appearance, and they can definitely make your isotope bone scan better. And quite often you can make it go back to normal with the intravenous zoledronic acid. They're long-acting drugs, so that's a really useful property. And generally speaking, they're well tolerated, but we'll briefly talk about some of the more uh, important uh, side effects. So intravenous zoledronic acid, that's our number one treatment choice, and more of that in a moment. We also have intravenous permidronate, which we used to use before uh, we switch to zoledronic acid. We also have a very good tablet, which is called resedronate or risedronic acid, and that is a two months course of treatment which you can repeat. And then we've got a couple of other treatments that we no longer have available. Those two at the bottom are tablets, but they're no longer uh, available. We used to use them in the past. So intravenous zoledronic acid, that's the first line treatment. Usually you only need one dose. So a single intravenous infusion, 15 to 30 minutes. It's more effective and longer lasting than anything else, probably due to a couple of things. Firstly, it sticks onto your bones. The drug molecule sticks onto your bones very strongly. And secondly, it has a very powerful effect on those osteoclasts, those bone cells driving the Paget's disease process. Uh, and that means it's, it's a long-acting and potent drug for Paget's disease. It's the most likely treatment that results in your blood test going to normal. There's also a little bit of evidence comparing it with the tablets, resedronate, kind of what we call a head-to-head -head study, showing that it's better, 
uh, when you look at pain relief and sort of quality of life uh, in general. In terms of needing repeat doses, uh, relatively few patients uh, relapse over kind of five, six years. Beyond that, and we're now seeing patients more than 10 years since we gave them their doses of legionate, we're beginning to see a few patients whose Paget's disease starts to become active again. We repeat their scan, we show it's active, the blood test goes back up. So some, some of the patients are going to need second doses, um, and certainly once you get out about 10 years, I think that's going to become uh, more frequent uh, and, and uh, more obvi obvious. We do have a publication, and Professor Fraser was a co-author of this paper, confirming that it is a, a really long-acting treatment. Just in the last couple of weeks, one of the, the lead author of this paper has published a little bit more data, showing that about, I don't know, 10 to 20 percent of patients uh, after about eight to 10 years, again to need maybe uh, another dose. So that's great, but not everybody can have this treatment. And the main limitation is if your kidneys are not working 100%. So if you've got kidney failure, so if your kidney function is below a certain level, and we calculate that carefully before you, we give you the treatment, you're not permitted to have the treatment. It's kind of officially contraindicated because it can make the kidney function uh, even worse under those circumstances. So it can, it can cause a deterioration in your kidney function, but it's very, very rare unless you already have a problem. But we still like patients to be well hydrated, drink plenty of fluids as they turn up for their infusion to make sure they optimise their kidney function on the day that, that they had. But it's really only in those who've got already some impairment of kidney function who run into any trouble. The commonest side effect is the flu-like reaction, what we call the flu-like reaction uh, to the intravenous zolotronic acid. And it is really a bit like having the flu. Probably about one third of patients get, get this. That's what we see uh, with our patients. It's usually the day after you get the infusion, you get some aches and pains. You might even feel a bit feverish. The drug stimulates the immune system to an extent. Usually, this only lasts a couple of days, very occasionally, it's more severe and lasts maybe weeks. It's certainly not life-threatening um, and, and it, it's not something that really limits the use of zoledronic acid and, and a bit of paracetamol uh, often helps relieve the symptoms of that particular problem. As we've already discussed, usually you only need one dose, certainly for the first few years. For some patients who have really severe disease, which we've heard is becoming less common, but if you've got lots of bones affected, it's very severe, you might need more than one dose, and we certainly see that uh, in, 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 a few, in a few patients. And as we've already discussed, if you wait long enough, eventually you might need uh, a, another infusion. And we would probably repeat the isotope bone scan, certainly we'd repeat the blood test to show that your pagets had reactivated before we gave you uh, another dose. Um, we do still sometimes use the other intravenous bisphosphonate, it's called pomidronate. It's probably not as effective or long-lasting as legionate, and you have to have multiple doses. There are various ways of doing it, uh, but you need several doses in a row, perhaps at weekly intervals, um, and it doesn't last as long. Probably it's not so bad in the context of if, if you've got kidney trouble, so we, we feel a bit more comfortable uh, using it in the context of patients who have some impairment of kidney function. For those who can't have intravenous treatments, maybe because of the kidney function, some patients just don't have veins that you can get a plastic cannula in, you just, for all sorts of reasons. Um, or it's just not available locally, or your GP wants to supervise the treatment and does not want to use the hospital service, then you might be someone who receives the tablets, and resedronate is, is the treatment under those circumstances. It's a two-month course of treatment. Um, it does quite often have to be repeated, and you might need several courses of treatment. And, and I, there is this head-to-head -head study showing that that the intravenous zoledronic acid is better if you can have 
that particular uh, treatment. And, and uh, as I've already said, you quite often need repeated courses of the tablets. And then last slide, um, we do have another treatment which is still around, which was the first treatment we used for Paget's disease, and that's um, a hormone that acts on bone. It's called calcitonin. The one we use at the moment is extracted from salmon. Um, just occasionally we use it. It's, a, it's an injection. It's often given daily or several times a week. It's quite short-acting. Um, it's of limited benefit. It's definitely not as good as bisphosphonates. There are a few situations that we might use it. It's quite rapidly acting. Uh, and sometimes in patients who have Paget's disease of the spine and it's pressing on the nerves or the spinal cord, we might use that as well as uh, a bisphosphonate. So just something uh, to be aware of. We also sometimes use drugs which don't have official legal or licensed approval for treating Paget's disease. And I've listed a couple there just for general interest. One of those is intravenous ibandronic acid, and our general belief is that's not really toxic for the kidneys, so we occasionally use that particular bisphosphonate for people who can't have intravenous zolotronic acid. But it's not a licensed indication, so very much for the specialist centres to, to be confident to use it under those circumstances. And the other treatment is donosumab, which is definitely safe for the kidneys. It doesn't have a licensed indication for Paget, so quite limited amounts of data uh, for using it for pages, but it's something we're quite interested in and looking at uh, to study further. I've been asked to talk or update you on the progress, or lack of it, uh, in writing the Paget's guidelines. Um, the association wanted to write some up-to-date guidelines on the diagnosis and management of patients with Paget's disease of bone. We want to do that for a number of reasons, one of which is to a raise awareness is one of the things that we've just been talking about because we know that there's a lot of misunderstanding about Paget disease out there and maybe if we had some good guidelines to refer to this might help to raise awareness amongst clinicians in general. So that's one of the reasons for doing it. A bit of background, um, the last UK guidelines were written in 2002 and a lot has changed since then. You've heard all about zoledronic acid, well that wasn't around in 2002. Lots of stuff about genetics has been discovered that we didn't know then. Lots of more papers have been written. Uh, uh, so all that data really needs assimilating, assimilating and putting into an up-to-date guideline. The most recent ones were written in 2014 uh, by the American Endocrine Society. And they have a bit of a sort of American slant on them, uh, a bit different to the UK situation, perhaps. Um, some people felt they weren't quite as rigorous as they might have been. There was a lot of stuff in there that we thought was a bit more opinion-based rather than evidence-based. And so we thought that needed some reassessment. Uh, some data, particularly some very good data from studies like the PRISM study, uh, which some of you might have taken part in, um, wasn't included in the, the American guidelines at all. So we thought this really needs looking into again. So we did. But before I tell you what we've been up to, I thought I'd just summarise some of the highlights from those 2014 guidelines, which are in many respects helpful, but may need to be a bit more rigorous. And these are some of the statements that they came up with. Uh, and the first thing they suggested, that if you want to diagnose Paget's disease, a plain, simple x-ray is pretty good at doing that. Uh, the, the appearances are fairly characteristic, and although some things can mimic it, they're very good at... Uh, in themselves of make, helping you to make the diagnosis. So if you've got someone who's got some symptoms of pain, x-ray it uh, and see if there's any Paget's disease there. They then suggested, well, yeah, we know that you might have Paget's disease in that bone, but uh, you need to know where it is. Uh, so an isotope bone scan, which you've just seen, um, can be used to show you which areas of bone are involved. Uh, which from a management point of view is important to know because if you know which is involved, you know what kind of complications you might get from it, it might influence how you treat someone. They talked about measuring blood tests, particularly alkaline phosphatase, uh, which is a useful marker of activity of bone, but as you've heard, can also come from liver. 
so you got the liver that's not working really well, put up the alkaline phosphatase, it's then very difficult to know where that alkaline phosphatase is coming. Is it coming from pagetic bone or is it coming from your liver that's not working? So in those situations, they recommended more specific bone turnover markers. There are a number of those out there uh, which we can measure if you've got the facility to do it, and not everybody does. And that can also be useful if you haven't got many bones involved. If you've only got one bone involved, particularly if it's a small bone involved, it's not going to produce a lot of alkaline phosphatase, so you can't measure that, but you could measure the bone-specific markers. They also suggested that patients with active disease or at risk of complications should be treated. Uh, I don't think anyone would particularly argue with that as a point, but it's really the evidence behind that that needs re -evaluate. Everybody used intravenous sodronic acid first. I don't think anybody would argue with that statement. Um, and it's very, very good at bringing down the activity of your bone. But they also suggested that doing so might slow the progression of complications or even prevent them, such as hearing loss, osteoarthritis, or maybe in reverse nerve entrapment problems. But the evidence to say that giving bisphosphonates will actually do that is quite weak. If you look at the papers, and that's much more of an opinion we felt than evidence-based. So whilst we might hope that that would be the case, we don't think there's the evidence to really say that, and that ought to be pointed out. They also suggest you should treat before you operate on the bone, which seems sensible because active bone loses blood, excess blood loss operation is probably not good. Um, but again, looking to see whether the evidence behind that really adds up. And they suggested that you could follow the activity by doing serial isotope bone scans, which you can do. You've seen that. Um, Dr. Stone's just been showing you pictures of before and after. But that's quite expensive to do. It involves quite a lot of radiation. So again, that's another area we wanted to look at. So our aim was to develop UK and European specific uh, guidelines. We may be leaving Europe soon, but we're still cooperating with our European colleagues. So we've got a number of European colleagues on our writing group uh, because they're very eminent in the field uh, and cooperation is the way to go with this. We want to evaluate all the available evidence we can get our paws on and then we want to make clear where the evidence exists and where it does not exist. In other words, which things seem like a good idea but don't actually have the evidence behind them as yet and therefore we need to say we have to do the investigations to find out if that really does stack up. This all started back in 2015, <laughs> um, and we're still at it. We formed a committee and elected a chairman, uh, and then what we did, we sat down, we had a meeting, we exchanged emails, conversations, and we brought up a short list of questions that we thought were really important and needed answering. We then undertook a comprehensive literature review, and I'll show you some of the details that we've gone into that, summarise the available evidence, divide up the work of writing it, and actually produce the guideline. That was the plan. And it seemed like a good one in 2015. <laughs> a chair was elected, and it was Muggins, so I've been elected chair. Uh, and these are all the members that you can see up there. I won't read them all out to you. But there's a hefty number of professors in there, and a very large number of very eminent persons and then there's me. And my job is to try and make sure they all do something and bully them into doing it. And try not to press, step on too many professorial egos in the process. We also have other very eminent people like Diana on it. Very important, we thought, to have nursing input. And we also have uh, two lay members. And we really thought we should have lay members of the committee, people who actually have Paget's disease, to comment on what we've written and see if it makes sense to people who actually have the condition. So we're very pleased to have Mr. Keith Simpson, who's standing over there, and a lady called Mrs. Ingrid Pryor, who unfortunately can't be here today. We've developed six questions. There's a lot of detail behind each question, which I wouldn't show here. Uh, so the first question we had was, which measurements or tools uh, can we use to identify and then diagnose Paget's disease of bone? In other words, how do we find out who's got it? Having done that, which sort of tools can we use that are effective in predicting whether or not you're going to respond to treatment? Because there's no point in giving treatment if it's not going to work for that individual. Then the really important question, who to treat? And what are the effects of drug treatment in Paget's disease? In other words, we've got these drugs, do they work? Are they effective? For individuals who are then given treatment, drugs, how often should we give it? How long should we give it for? 
and what's the best way of giving it? And what are the effects of non-drug treatment? Drug treatments are great, but they're not the be-all and end-all of everything. People get complications, osteoarthritis, they get fractures, they get nerve entrapment. They may need input from other people, including surgeons, uh, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, all those sorts of things. Is there any evidence that doing all these other things actually helps? For each question, we nominated a lead from the working group and a few other people to help them with that question. And that lead is responsible for making sure that something gets written about each question. So we then, having got that, had to do a literature search. Now, uh, literature search is very time consuming and we want to look through the whole literature on Paget's disease, so there's a lot of that. Um, and eventually we made the decision that we actually need to get a professional body to do that for us. And we were very lucky we got joint funding from the Paget's Association, the European Calcified Tissue Society, and the International Osteoporosis uh, Foundation, and a company called IMP, uh, who, will be under, who have undertaken the research uh, for us and gone through all the questions that we have. Uh, and for each question, they identified a hefty number of papers. This varied between 1,100 and 1,900 papers to go through. Um, and these papers went all the way back to the early part of the 20th century, so quite a big search. Uh, they were then sorted through for quality and relevance. So this is an example, this is question two, um, and we found 1,900 papers for that. Now it's really difficult to go through 1,900 papers, so you need to sort of sort through them in some way. So what the, the company did, it's a very standard approach, it is to look at the title and look at the little mini abstract, every paper, a little mini abstract, telling you a little bit about it, and see whether it was relevant to the question. If you did that, you can get rid of quite a large number. So we got rid of some nearly 1,800 of those papers that way. That left 106, which you then had to get out and look at in detail because they seemed relevant to what you wanted to know. And if you do that, you then find a number of other papers in there that don't actually tell you very much. So some of that might be just reviews of other papers, which are useful, but not if you want to go back to literature to see what actual evidence there is. So chuck those up. And you might check out anything that's really small or just case reports and things because they're not strong evidence for what we want to know about, so they get checked out. And when you did that with this particular question, you got down to a manageable 57 papers. And this particular question is led by Professor Rob Layfield over there, uh, who very, very kindly also thought, well, there may be some other papers out there that they might have missed, and did his own manual search. So he found another nine he thought were relevant. And by cooperating with people writing the other questions, there are another 32 papers from the other questions that seemed important to this one. So you can see how you get your literature together. So our current situation is that we have two questions that have been completed. The question four, which was um, the, the effects of drug treatment, and question three, six, which is the non-drug treatments. They have been completed. We have a little narrative, a summary of it, which we will be discussing. Uh, question two uh, is very nearly complete and I believe Rob's going to be sending me uh, a summary of it very shortly. The remaining questions have all been started but not completed yet. And this morning we held a meeting before we met today uh, because a fair number of people who were on that writing group were here. Uh, we had a discussion about progress and we're going to actually take a couple of days off, lock ourselves in a room somewhere and we're going to actually write the rest of them and then we'll have them all written and we can actually start putting it all together. So that is the current situation. Once we've got it all done, we'll be able to get this published in the medical literature. This will be very helpful for clinicians. It'll be very helpful to raise awareness. And, and from that, we will probably do other things like developing a, a, a paper on, on the best practice approach that we can distribute to clinicians treating Paget's disease.